I'm going to read the word this morning, the passage we're going to be looking at together, and then I'm going to pause for a word of prayer and we'll dive right in as we've been taking time over these summer months to look at uh, people's encounters with Christ and uh, both what Jesus said and what he meant and what it meant to those who are watching and listening and living before him. And so I'm going to read this morning in John and chapter 19 and verse 1. It says this, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to, the whole, to, said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you. And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason... He who delivered me to you has the greater sin. I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that this morning as we open your word, that you are a God again who speaks, who declares his glory. Thank you that all around us, day in and day out, you are showing your greatness, your mercies new every morning. And I just pray that again this morning as we open your word, as we gather together, again, we would trust and rely on only you to make your word real unto our hearts. That again, we might not academically look for words about you, but that we might understand the spirit that is you. That desires to make us, to mold us, to shape us, to move us. That we might become children of God, that we might glorify you in all that we do. And I just pray this morning that again, your word would go forth and that we would grab hold of nothing more, nothing less than what you have for us. And so it is with this trust alone that you are speaking by your spirit that we open your word today and trust that you will uh, guide us, direct us and share with us those things that you have for us today. And so we give thanks in all of this in Jesus name. Amen. All right, well, this morning, as we open the word in John chapter 19, once again, we see a time in which, interacting with Jesus, a scenario in which we see the moments before Jesus' crucifixion. And as we look at these words, and at this time, it's Pilate's conversation that stands out in that Jesus, in all of this, remained quiet. We're often reminded that as it says, like a lamb silent before the slaughter, Jesus, though questioned, though assaulted, though beaten, though abused, remained silent before them. And yet, Pilate in this moment speaks and he says something that all of a sudden causes the silence of Jesus to end and the boldness of Jesus to strike forward. And it's that boldness, that moment that caught my attention this week. And I hope that as God has been reminding you, uh, reminding me that it would be a good reminder for you also. And that is this, that often I need to allow God to destroy the illusions that often I live by. And there are many. And I found it interesting this week, laughing at a few things. I'm often reading about strange things that strange people do because it shines a light on how strange I am 
and, and, and often the strange things that I do. And, and there's a point there where often we can choose to live and we can make choices and decisions based on a false reality. And if we're not careful, it will bring us to, to a dangerous and precarious place. Good example this week, reading about a group of people, in fact, those seeking plastic surgery. Uh, between 2015 2016, 13% increase year to year, people wanting plastic surgery. Why? Because they did not like how they looked in selfies. All right? But I'm going to tell you something. Plastic surgeons themselves created a campaign to talk people out of it. Do you know why? Because their choice to choose searching for plastic surgery was this. Most of them thought their nose was too big. Here's the problem. Modern cell phones have a wide angle lens and when you hold that cell phone 12 inches from your face, guess what happens? Science proved it. Your nose can look up to 30% bigger due to the lens and where you hold the camera. And you can take a picture taken with a regular camera and a selfie with a cell phone and shock and awe, 30% bigger that thing on the front of your face. And here's a group of people seeking surgery. Why? Because they took a selfie and they're under the illusion that what? Their nose is too big when in fact their nose is quite fine. Isn't that fascinating? They're under the illusion. They saw something. That, that they, they saw a perspective point. It was actually a false reality that their nose was too big. And so they began to search a course of action to fix it. That's dangerous, isn't it? And, and it made me think of how often I choose course based on false reality, false information, or a false perception, or a precarious perspective. And thankfully, we serve a God who does not allow us to stay in a false reality, though sometimes we might choose to. As you go back in scriptures, and for time's sake, I won't read them all, but I want to remind you of a couple of great moments in time in which God didn't allow people to stay in that state of false uh, perception. Moses, in Exodus chapter 4, when God said, listen, Moses, I want you to go and free my people. And do you remember Moses' response? I can't go. What will they say when I tell them, who will I say sent me? God says, no problem. Tell them, I am has sent you, right? How, what if they don't believe me? God says, listen, no problem, Moses. Put your hand inside your coat, remember? And he gave him signs. Pour the water out, and it became blood, and his hand was leprous, and he put it back in, and it was healed. And he showed him these things, and he said, I, I'm going with you. And then finally, in Exodus chapter 4, God said, go and speak to Pharaoh. And he said this, Moses said, listen, Lord, please, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow in speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, who makes him mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Isn't that great? What was Moses' illusion? Moses' illusion was, I am unable, therefore I cannot. God, r reality check, no, listen, I am able, therefore you can. Just because you can't doesn't mean you aren't able. If God can, <laughs> he is able. And what did he want to tell him? He had to break the illusion of what? His inability. 
because it wasn't about his ability. It wasn't that God was asking him to do something for God. God was preparing what he was going to do for Moses and through Moses. You see, there was a moment where he had to break the illusion that he wasn't able. He had to see the truth. And that truth was that God was with him. Another one that I uh, love and always and often come back to, remember when God came and told uh, Abraham and Sarah that he was going to give them a child and he promised them and years went by and that child didn't uh, show and, and God again would come and say, no, an heir you will have. A and again he would come and make the promise and in in Genesis chapter 18, I love again when he comes and he says in verse 10, Listen, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Listen, one, there was an illusion that she was too old. Again, unable. Here's the second. Sarah, it says, verse 15, denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh. Here's my, one of my favorite moments in the book of Genesis. But the angel said, verse 15, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Isn't that great? Here's the conversation. Why did Sarah laugh? I didn't laugh. Oh, yes, you did. You see, if there was any illusion that God wasn't listening, God didn't hear the heart, quickly vanquished, wasn't it? He took that moment, and the angel could have just left and went, I didn't laugh. Ha ha. She denies it, but we know what's going to happen. No, but notice, took the time to what? Make sure she knew that God knew. Any illusion that God didn't hear the heart, gone. There were other times that God chose to take that moment and, and, and destroy any illusion. Pilate's illusion this morning was what? Pilate heard he was afraid when he heard that he had claimed to be the Son of God. Pilate said to him, John 19 verse 10, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? What was Pilate's illusion? That he was in control. That Jesus' fate was up to him. And Jesus let all go. What was said, what was done. And in this moment, he chooses to say this. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Reality check. <laughs> Pilate, no. He needed to know that in this moment, though Pilate felt he had the keys, he owned the moment, he owned the decision. That Jesus' fate was in greater hands than his. And I find often this can be one of those areas where I find this vast illusion, the illusion of control. And I think God's been reminding me of this often and lately. Again, interestingly enough, studies done. One of them where they found that people, listen, if they were playing a game in a casino of dice, felt more confident in their ability to win if they rolled the dice as opposed to someone else. Think about that for a moment. People, when buying a lottery ticket, felt more confident in their chances to win if they picked the numbers versus 
someone else or something else like the lottery machine. What makes you think that if someone else rolls the dice, that if something else picks a random numbers, that it will have any effect on the ping pong balls coming out of the machine on lottery day? Do you see what I'm saying? No, none. They did another study where they tested people coming to a table and playing a game where a dealer would simply hand out cards and the person with the highest card won the round. And they looked and they brought in characters and when one person portrayed, dressed, shabbily, nervous, less confident, the opposing players at the table felt more likely to win the round. And when that person showed up looking confident, well-dressed, and wealthy, the other players felt less confident to win the round. What does someone else's clothing have anything to do with what card the dealer is going to give you next? Do you see what I'm saying? All false presence of an illusion of control that someone else's clothing makes me have it more or less together, that someone else's role is less or more than mine, all an illusion of control in which none of it is, none of it. And yet, as we go through life, so often I find that I have this feeling of control, that, that I can do something more, that, that something's in my hands. Uh, often been going back as of late to James in chapter 4, in which, again, may be familiar to some of you, but in James chapter 4 and verse 13, it, James writes this. He says, listen, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Isn't that a great reminder this morning? He says, listen, as you go out of your door each day, you go out saying, hey, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to go to Costco. I'm going to fill my grocery cart. I'm going to come home. I'm going to do this. I'm going to engage in this business. I'm going to seek this job. I'm, and, and he says, listen, all of it is arrogance. Why? Because in the moment, you're walking under the illusion that you are in control and you don't know. Your car could break down. You could lose your job. You could lose your way. You could lose your mind like I do on a daily basis. You could lose your way. But we go all under the premise and perception that we will go where we want, when we want, and do what we want when we get there. And James says, listen, it's arrogance. It's all arrogance. Because if we today were walking in reality, we'd understand this, that there are greater things than us at work and that, that we are a mere vapor. And what we should say is, if the Lord wills, I will go. I find it interesting how much of this illusion affects my daily life. To put it in perspective, let me read how, what one American author said, and, and, and he put it this way. Peace requires us to surrender our illusions of control. If you're searching for peace today, here, here's the premise. It first requires us to surrender our illusions of control. We can love and care for others, but we cannot possess our children, lovers, family, or friends. We can assist them, we can pray for them, and we can wish them well, yet in the end their happiness 
and suffering depend on their thoughts, actions, and not our wishes. You see, as this author wrote, he's looking at the fact that so often we can put such burden on our ability to possess our children, our loved ones, our family members, to protect them, to keep them, to hold them, to help them, and yet the reality is what? <laughs> However much you try, you're helpless. You're actually helpless to change them and do anything for them in this world. I mean, you can to an extent, but there's nothing you can do to what? Guarantee their health, wealth, or prosperity. Anything is a grander of illusion. Because we don't have control. And it's that hard check reality as we look through the book of Job that sees the fact that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Because you can eat all the right foods and go to the right places and not hang out with the wrong crowd and still get cancer. Still get sick. You can follow all the rules of the road and you can still get hit by another car. What you do today doesn't guarantee anything for tomorrow. And yet we walk in that illusion of grandeur that we can. As we look at the way the Lord lived, and I think it fascinating that Jesus chose in this moment, out of all that Pilate said, listen, I have you and your fate in my hand. Jesus no, you don't. My fate is the Father's alone. As we read about Jesus and the way that he walked, we read in Philippians, as Paul writes, he says, listen, Philippians 2, verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Did you notice? It tells us he what? He emptied himself. He did not regard equality with God uh, something to be grasped. It actually goes in John chapter 5, and Jesus says this. Listen to these words. Jesus answered and said, Truly I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son of Man also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. Do you notice? Jesus had no illusion of what? Grandeur. I, though the Son of God, am nothing with what? without what? The Father God. I only go where he says go. I only say what he says to say. And I only do what he says I should do. No illusion that apart from the Father, he was anything more than he was. Because what he was, was what the Father had made him. He was the Son. He was our Savior. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 puts it this way. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, 
who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. But while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus kept entrusting himself. No illusion of what he needed to do for God, the Father, as he was clinging to all that God the Father was doing through him. You see, today, I have to stop and wonder just how many illusions I allow, precarious perspective points, to dictate my actions. And, and, and ask if I am actually watching for when God is prepared to step in my way. You think back, a, a passage we've read together often in the book of Samuel, when the Israelites are going into war and they're losing to the Philistines. And remember what they said and did? We forgot the ark. We forgot the symbol of the presence of God. Get it. And they went and they got it and they came into the camp cheering. What was the illusion? We're not winning the fight, but with the box, we will win the fight. <laughs> the key to control, we have it. All we need is the box. What did God do in that situation? They came in, they roared, they cheered. The presence of God. What did the Philistines say? Everybody, fight for your lives. The living God is with them. Here's what happened. They did. God said, Philistines, take the box. Okay, Israel, you think you're in control? You think the box will save you? No, you're not. And no, it won't. All this while, I'm in control. I'm the one who has you. I'm the one who keeps you. I'm the one who provides victory for you. Anything less is an illusion of grandeur. And that bubble needs to be popped. I think how many illusions I have. <laughs> Here's one. Time is my own. Have you been there? You're about to have that time after a busy week, quiet time, and somebody pulls into the driveway. Someone who likes to talk more than you're prepared to listen. And there's that small seed of anger that starts to boil up and grow. Now of all times, when I was just about to put my feet up, when I was just about to rest and relaxed, right? If I was going to relax, now they're going to come? Wait a second. Is your time your own? Here's God. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> You've been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. And though you may feel like relaxing, I have someone who needs <laughs> to be ministered to. And I even gave you the privilege that I brought them to your doorstep. I didn't make you go to them. You should be saying thank you to me. Right? Here's the illusion. <laughs> my time is my own. We talked about Jesus and his grand ministry of interruptions. People grabbing his cloak, stopping him, getting in his way, getting in his face. <laughs> Sitting in a tree, looking at him, staring at him, dropping people through the roof to heal him. Right? Right? His time was never his own, but he always knew the Father's time. No illusion. I think my time is my own. I think my kids are my own, right? I can protect them. I can mold them. I can shape them. I can make them. And if it wasn't for my, my, my wife, they'd be in big trouble at this point. Uh, because the parts I've shaped are pretty awkward, and, and she's managed to recover those things and redeem them for the Lord, right? 
And as they grow older, I'm being reminded more and more, no, I can't. I can't protect them everywhere they go. I can't do everything for them. I can't always be beside them. I won't always be with them. I had a great uh, picture pop up on my Facebook feed uh, of a, a past student from uh, Cape and Rain. It's wild to watch as we were a young family in ministry. Watch now students we had grow up and become young families. And, and this uh, wonderful young lady that was uh, a student uh, for a season with us out in Quebec had posted a picture of her little son's hand in hers. And it said, I've been praying often lately for the woman that one day will hold his hand. But right now, he holds mine. And it was a beautiful picture and a beautiful moment. And, and what, was the, what was the understanding? She knew that his life, though very small now, was what? It was a season and a time. And one day, she's going to have to what? Let go and let God take mold shape. I believe often I'm in control of my finances, my income, my provision, and the provisions for my family. And I've seen how often God will create work or an income or, or a provision in the strangest times, in the strangest places. And yet, when I don't see them, then all of a sudden it becomes all about what? My ability to find it, to get the job, to make the job, to make the resume good enough, <laughs> to make it polished enough that what? You can always fudge the truth a little bit to make it sound you're a little better than you are, right? And all of a sudden, it's all about what? Me. And then in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says to his disciples, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you are to eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clo clothing. Consider the ravens, for they are neither sow nor reap. They never store, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? What's the illusion? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all this will be added. And yet the illusion remains, I've got this. I'm in control. I've got to do this. And all the while, God's saying, no, I've got this. Jesus took a moment in which, in one sentence, he dispelled Pilate's assumption. His perspective that was pointing him in the wrong place. He needed to know that in all things, God the Father was in control. And Jesus knew, as the Son, he had him. And today, as we go out these doors, it's a great opportunity to pray for what illusions I'm walking under. Because sometimes it's the assumption, and that assumption is created by seeing things from the wrong side. Like a phone a little too close to your face, <laughs> and a giant nose that you think needs help, when in reality it looks just fine the way it is. Right? He's got you. He's with you. But all is arrogance if we walk out these doors and think he doesn't go with you before you, strengthen you, just as Moses needed to learn, just because he couldn't doesn't mean he was unable. You need to have that illusion broken up because God can, he was able. What are the illusions we're often living by? And today, are we open to hearing God's word as he comes to pop and poke that bubble and make us see the truth today? Today, he's got us. We are in his hands. 
And as Jesus entrusted himself to a faithful father, so today we too trust ourselves. Trust our loved ones, trust our children, trust those whom we long to know the Lord as unbelievers. We today entrust it all to a faithful God who does far more than ever we would ever ask or imagine. Now, we're going to take some communion today. And it's a reminder of that very thing. That as we go out, it's a great reality check. That the Christian walk is not the illusion of religion. That you say the right words, say the right prayers, go to the right church, sit in the right service, listen to the right speaker, sing the right hymns or songs that have to be sung at the right tempo, <laughs> accompanied by the right instruments, <laughs> say the right words, memorize the right verses or poems. That's not the Christian life. That's an illusion. And often one, hypocrites portray in the name of Jesus. That illusion needs to be popped. Truth? We've been bought with a price, so we are no longer our own, so that as Jesus laid down his life for each and every one of us, we can go out those doors and lay down our lives for one another. Not just the people who we think deserve it, but even the people who reject us, who hate us, who insult us, who take advantage of us. Today, we are the body of Christ on this earth. Not an illusion of Christ, the actual functioning body of Christ, forgiving as he forgave, loving as he loved, listening as he listened, patient as he was patient, attached to the Father as everything as he was attached to the Father. And today, this reminder as we take the bread and the cup, is that reminder of his brokenness, that he was broken for us. And today, as the body of Christ, we go out purposing to be broken for one another. As he took that brokenness to the cross and shed his blood, only to claim the victory over death that God the Father had for him, that today we walk in the shedding of that blood in victory over sin and death. What a great picture today. What a great reminder that today we don't walk in things that are a shadow of the truth, but we walk in truth. God has us. He's with us. Never to leave us nor forsake us. And he's got us. We need only remember not to put any stock in the illusions of any greater grandeur than we are. Servants of a holy God. A great God. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take communion together to be reminded of these things and as our unity together in Him. Lord, thank you that this morning we can open your word and be reminded that you do not allow us to stay in our illusions of grandeur, our misconceptions of life, but you were made to be known that you are a great God, that you are King that we are not our own. That today you control the things that we do not control. That we do not know our time, whether to live or to die. Whether we make it to today or tomorrow, we thank you that you do. And that today we can simply rest, find peace, in knowing that someone far greater than us has it, has our loved ones, has everyone around us, is chasing after us, is molding and shaping us. And for that, we thank you. Thank you that today we can know you, that we can abide in you, and that as Moses learned and Sarah learned, you see our hearts, you know us, you declare yourself to us. And yet, just because we think we can't does not mean we are unable. Today, we walk in a God who is able. And we 
walk in victory. Thank you for all that you are and all that you will continue to be as a faithful father. As your loving children, we walk hand in hand with you in all things. And for this we give thanks in Jesus' name.